Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Melinda Smith, and I am the Vice Provost EDI and the Associate Vice President for Research EDI at the University of Calgary. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the sixth annual Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Week at the University of Calgary. EDI Week 2023 will present a series of bold conversations, keynotes, and panels, which are designed to inspire and challenge what it means to support equity, diversity, and in inclusion and accessibility, both institutionally and individually, in order to build solidarity and affect change. Our first speaker is Dr. Wanda Costin, Dean of the Smith School of Business at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Dr. Costin will be speaking about not just allyship, but action, insights on how to implement the changes needed to address equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Before we begin though, let me offer uh, the land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siskaka, the P uh, Pikunai and the Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nations and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bears Poor, and Wesley's First Nation. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Now I would like to introduce Elder Colleen Sitting Eagle. Elder Sitting Eagle is a Sisaka language instructor who has worked with the Sisaka culture and heritage since 1992. We are pleased to call Elder Colleen Sitting Eagle at U, a U of Calgary alumni and to invite her to start us off in a good way with a blessing. Okay, get connected to the point of the scanotony. And okay, that's a cup of what's my cup to move for. I greet all of you this morning. I will uh, do my blessing in my language, which is the six car language. And uh, I will be with you for a little bit. Uh, as you may notice, I'm in class, I'm at school. So I take this opportunity to spend a little bit of time giving you my blessing. So I shall start my blessing. I am up to two can of Christiquia, Moxino Cup, no tie ice cheeks, axi topo capu to Kimex, or can of cup what to exceed a sap to toki, or Kimatu Kinana no camp tap cheap with pinan. Ahuatsuts for Motsius, Okitapakoi Mamuksa, Awaiki two weeks, Okikimatu Kinana no Kisikako, Sita Pesci Sapumapi, Oki eats scan, eats scanapi, Okikimatu Kinan of Kisquax no can of what's me, Akisita Mokaya, Ita Motatsimi out skimman on weeks, Okikanexicus no to no what's me, Miss Epipoes to Mokina Nikini Taxin. Okay, I'm going to mix to cup what to eat in subs to Okay, I'm going to go to the house. i to go to the house. i say their prayer and uh, leave it up to the listener to try and figure out, okay, what was she saying? What was he saying? Most of the time I like to translate what I've, what I've asked our creator to lay his blessings upon all of you that are listening today. And for the subject that we're talking about today, uh, we need this, we need, uh, we need to work together to make our world, our nation, our communities uh, better than what they, you know, what they, what they are and what they have been. 
uh, like you may have, um, um, some of you I, I've talked to, um, God gave me two gifts, my son and my daughter. I lost my son in September. So a lot of time, I'm just kind of getting back into um, speaking publicly. It's a hard thing, but um, I'm sure many of us have gone through losses. Um, but, and this takes me to the introduction, the introduction that I want to give. Oh, in my prayer, I also asked for blessings upon your families, uh, the sick, the poor, the people that are suffering. So anyways, uh, my, uh, I guess my introduction and my little lip for today is allyship, active support, working together, working with someone in all forms of um, issues that we're, we're faced with today. Our nation, Black uh, Six of God Nation, we're faced with many issues, many uh, departments don't work together. They, they, they assume, okay, we know all about this, we're trained in all this, but one thing they leave out is the elders, the young people, the little guy, the little, the little children. My late father used to say, if a child was able to speak to, um, you know, to a group of people in a conference or a workshop, this child probably can teach us many things because they're so pure, because they, they don't find fault in anything. Uh, and their positive optimis optimism is so pure. And elders have lived many years to, to where, you know, to whatever age they're at. And they've gone through the changes in the world. They've gone through world wars. They've gone through wars within their, within their nation uh, to survive. So when we talk about working together, that's the six of God word. We will work together. Uh, so in all aspects of, um, you know, this week's uh, EDI week, I want you to carry the words, let's work together, working together. Because without it, nothing can be properly done. Everybody needs to give their own little, um, their own little knowledge in everything, in anything that they know. Like with the children I teach here, I teach them the six God language, not just the language, but the culture that that um, uh, the background of the language is the culture. And without culture, we can't introduce the language to them. So a lot of times uh, when we when we say we will work together, those are just mere words that we we kind of throw out there. But it's actual. The action is what is important. So if that if I've kind of uh, babbled along the way, um, I'm very um, um, I guess how I speak to people. It doesn't matter. Uh, as long as they understand what I'm trying to say. So I hope I've introduced uh, the week to you uh, through my understanding of allyship and um, um, working together. So if that's good, um, I give you all my blessings. Uh, if I suddenly pop out of here, I have to go back to class. So I, I thank all of you. And with your blessings that you give me, it strengthens me every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elder Sitting Eagle. Uh, condolence to you for the loss of your son. Um, I hope, we hope that his memory continues to be a blessing in itself. Thank you for your blessing and for the wisdom of encouraging us to work together as a thank you uh, for your for being here with us, taking time 
uh, always teaching us, um, I offer you this tobacco, this gift of tobacco. And I wish you the very best. And I know your students are fortunate to have you uh, uh, give the attention to them each and thank every you. time you go before them. So thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Now I it's a distinct uh, pleasure to introduce to you the University of Calgary's interim provost and vice president academic, uh, Dr. Penny Wertner, uh, who, is, uh, who just recently stepped down as our Dean of Kinesiology, where she served from 2012 to 2022. And to, be, and to take on the uh, uh, responsibility uh, to be provost and vice president academic. Dr. Workner is one of Canada's most distinguished consultants in the field of sports psychology. She has served as a sports psychologist consultant for Canada's national and Olympic teams since 1985. She's one of the founding members of the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport and Physical Activity, and has been named one of the top 20 most influential women in sport, physical activity uh, in, in Canada for in the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport and Physical Activity. Let's just put it this way. She's among one of the top women leaders in Canada. Dr. Whitener has more than 30 years of distinguished experience in sports psychology, sports related management consulting, program management, academic leadership. She came to the University of Calgary after spending 12 years at the University of Ottawa as Director of Associate Dean of the School of Human Kinetics. And we have been privileged to have her serve at the University of Calgary since, and it's my pleasure to work with her. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce to you Dr. Penny Wertner. Thank you very much, Melinda. Dr. Smith, I, I will just add my thanks to Elder Colleen Sitting Eagle for the blessing. It is always a lovely way to start our meeting. So thank you, Melinda, for your introduction and, and certainly for your leadership of the Office of, of EDI as we, we move towards an inclusive and equitable institution. Um, on behalf of the University of Calgary, I'd like to welcome everyone to EDI Week, which is an integral dimension of our efforts to, to really embed equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility into all parts of our university life, our, our, our research that individuals conduct, our teaching and learning, and, and the work environments that we, we live in on a daily basis. Uh, we are very much committed to removing barriers that, that have been and, and still are encountered by members of equity diverse deserving groups. So I really encourage everyone to, to participate in the events and the activities planned this week uh, to raise awareness, to expand our EDI literacy and education, and to really create pathways for all members of our campus community in order to flourish. So thanks very much, Melinda, and back over to you. Thank you, Penny. Uh, <clears throat> EDI Week is celebrating six years of encouraging <laughs> a more equitable, inclusive, and accessible campus, of encouraging pluralism and efforts to mitigate polarization and to, and, and to advance ways of how we can live well together. And it's about building social consciousness through respectful and transparent discussions and workshops geared towards uplifting and emboldening our campus community to generate social change, empowering us. February also marks the start of Black History Month, which is commemorating its sixth anniversary since being officially recognized by the government of Alberta under the theme this year of Ours to Tell. This week, Focus on Solidarity is a chance for you of Calgary to honor our diverse community by spotlighting influential topics like minority experiences in higher education, indigenous awareness, and anti-racist allyship. At U of Calgary, we pride ourselves on our commitment to building more inclusive, diverse, and accessible campus. 
And one in where our, our students, faculty, and staff flourish because of their differences, not despite them. We are honored to be one of 17 Canadian institutions selected by the Tri Agency to participate in the Dimensions EDI pilot, which recognizes that multi-perspective, live experiences, and diverse communities foster research excellence, innovation, creativity. U of Calgary is also the first university in Canada to implement the res a Respect in the Workplace program, which will be elevated by our recently launched Inclusive Excellence Cluster Hiring Initiative. The initiative addresses the underrepresentation of equity deserving groups and answers the demand for change by our campus community, faculty, staff, students, alumni, and leadership. We, it's part of our effort to further reflect the diversity of our broader community. These initiatives are made possible by the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, which serves as a central hub for education by empowering innovative solutions to longstanding societal and campus problems, and by building our capacity and respect and understanding. As the workshops and lectures are underway this week, I would like to invite you to set an intention for learning and growth as we explore the many pathways to equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility at the University of Calgary. We will continue to strive to foster a community of change makers and innovators, not only this week, but into the future. With that, it is my honor to introduce our first keynote for the week, Dr. Wanda Costin, who is a champion of inclusiveness in business with many years of expertise in academic leadership, research and teaching, and senior management in both the private and public sector. Her unique approach to collaborative leadership and commitment to driving positive societal change has made Dr. Costin a catalyst for partnerships between academia, business, and public organizations on equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility initiatives and training programs. Dr. Costin earned a PhD in sociology at Washington State University, an EM executive MBA from Pepperdine University and a Bachelor of Science from the University, United States Military Academy. And, and Dr. Costin has been Dean at the Smith School of Business since 2021, prior to which she was Dean at uh, Grant McEwen. Uh, University in Edmonton. Her commitment to integrity and sustainability is showcased through her continued collaboration with community and business leaders, faculty, staff, and alumni to ensure Smith School graduates are prepared to meet society's changing expectations uh, of business. Dr. Costin has undertaken research in areas such as managing diversity, racial and gender inequality in organizations, women and leadership and strategic human resources and currently sits on the board of the Kingston Economic Development Corporation, as well as the Business Schools Association of Canada. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wanda Costin, a keynote. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Smith. I first must say uh, how grateful I am to be here. And I'm particularly struck by Elder Sitting Eagle's uh, charge to us really, which is action, but together. And, and of course that leads us into today's topic. If we could launch, thank you for sharing. Uh, so today's topic really is, is focused on this thing we call allyship, but more so not just what an ally is, but how do we put that into action? Because what we're noticing is words are not enough. And I'm happy to hear all the great work that's happening at the University of Calgary, because we need key leaders, uh, institutions in Canada that can influence what's happening, not just in North America, but across the globe. Next slide, please. So I want to begin, uh, and I invite you also to use uh, the Q&A button at the bottom that you see there. Uh, what I have to present today isn't particularly long, but it is meant to trigger some thoughts and inquiry. And the bulk of the time I'd like to uh, spend with, with Q&A and people sharing their thoughts uh, and so forth. I should also say, as I typically do, that I'm a US citizen who has enjoyed 
uh, living in Canada, my adopted country. But what that does mean is that on occasion, I'm a bit provocative. So I, I invite you to, to walk with me on this journey, which may trigger some things for you in the sense of a call to action, because really that's what we're talking about today. So here are some definitions of an ally that I particularly like and that resonate with me. And you'll notice some key words in here, actively promotes. That's more than just uh, saying that you are a partner, calling oneself a ally. It's what kinds of actions are we engaged in? Notice the notion of conscious efforts. This isn't something we do off the side. This isn't something that we're winging it. This is really a concerted, intentional effort to promote and advance those who have been marginalized. This next one I have to tell you is my favorite because it invites this notion of partnership, collaborator, co-conspirator, and notice we're fighting injustice, promoting equity. And we tend to focus, at least I do, I'm in the school of business, on the workplace, because often in North America, that's when this thing called inequality, inequities are most visible. And if we can address them within the workplace, then that tends to have an impact on our personal relationships and how we enact our lives in society as a whole. And then finally, this notion of striving to end oppression, this notion that there are groups of people in society who historically have been oppressed and that we should be freed from that, this real notion of true equality. These are the definitions that ring true for me and I share them with you to kind of ground us in some common language in terms of what we're talking about. Next slide, please. So what is this thing called allyship? And again, you're gonna see some key words, active practice, consistent practice. Allyship for all of us typically requires us to unlearn and relearn what we think we know, how we move through the world. This notion of a privileged group of people of which most of us, because we happen to reside in North America, can place that label on ourselves, notwithstanding that some of how we present to the world, some of our social identity may actually put us in a disadvantaged position through no fault of our own, merely for how we present in the world. I also like the notion of a lifelong process. We happen to reside in academia, in post-secondary education in particular, where we are constantly talking about lifelong learning. The implication of which is one never knows everything. One never stops learning. The other piece that really rings true for me is this notion of building trust. Many marginalized communities have been taken advantage of for centuries. And yet often those of us in privilege often believe that folks who just, just believe us, failing to recognize how we got to this point in time, what that history is, particularly for the marginalized, for the people who have been oppressed. So this notion that allyship is this lifelong learning, this revealing of information that perhaps we didn't know. And then last but not least, when we actually take the privilege we have and use that capital on behalf of other people to amplify those voices. Now I will tell you that that whole amplification has some drawbacks, has some opportunities for us to be careful about how we do what we think we are doing. Next slide, please. And that leads me to this discussion of performative allyship. And this is where we're gonna experience some tension because we often find most certainly in light of the murder of George Floyd and some of the other tragic incidences 
that have happened in the last couple of years. We have certainly seen a rise, uh, particularly as we think about Black History Month, uh, white people uh, standing up in solidarity with Black people. But what we really see is this performative, this I need to be part of this or else I'm an outsider, or this guilt feeling, this pressure to conform and participate, irrespective of understanding the, the core issues, the core situations, the systemic nature of what is unfolding today before us on TV, on your phones. And so this first piece is really something we see today on social media. And I love the term keyboard warring, right? So I'm a warrior, but we're really only a warrior in the protection of the space in which we are using our keyboards on a computer or on our phones. This hashtag activism, which actually doesn't require us to do anything, but to just say that we're on board, let's link arms, we're in solidarity. And when we push ourselves, if we're honest with ourselves, we find ourselves really uncomfortable to sit and have the difficult conversations that are not just necessary, but are required to address the root cause, these, these root causes of inequity and inequality. And that discomfort, and if I may be so bold as a US citizen, this is one of my own biases. My perspective and perception of Canadians is the discomfort that they will appear rude. That is like the worst thing you could say to a Canadian is to be rude. And yet, we must have difficult conversations. We must push people outside their comfort zones. We must be willing to speak about the unspeakable if we're really going to have any hope of addressing inequity and inequality. It's also about acknowledging our own personal responsibility. In the US, you will often hear uh, white people say, well, I didn't own slaves, so it's not me. Failing to acknowledge that they actually benefit from slavery even today. That some of the socially constructed differences along race don't exist were it not for slavery. And even some of the systemic issues in terms of what is success, what does it mean to be smart, what does it mean to be intelligent, who is worthy, who gets access, is grounded in that horrible experience called slavery. So one can't actually say we don't benefit from that, when in fact we still are. And then this last piece is really critical is our unwillingness to take our own social and economic capital and apply it to the systems and to admit that we benefit from these systems. Because then we have to admit that maybe it's not a meritage. Maybe I didn't fully get to where I am based on my own effort. That maybe there are some things at play that allow me to be positioned in a unique way that gives me an advantage that I did not earn, merely for how I present in the world. This is performative allyship and something we have to move beyond if the goal truly, genuinely is to address inequality and inequity through the depths of the systemic structures that we see at play in society. Next slide, please. I love this term. This happens to be a colleague of mine here at Queens, by the way, in the Faculty of Health Sciences, which is this notion of what does it mean to apply critical thinking, intentional exploration into this thing we call allyship. How do we begin to break away from the normal predominant way of thinking about how we deal with inequity. It is often perceived by the marginalized that those in power, those with historical privilege are coming, swooping in to save us 
to, to help us. And some of this in North America, certainly more so in the US than in Canada, is grounded in this notion that in some way, because of the individual nature of humanity, we might be responsible for where we are. And in those times when we are not, the privileged few swoop in to say, let me tell you how this should work. Let me help you learn the rules of the game. It doesn't occur to us that the game is set up for a certain group of people. That's what we mean by structural inequality, structural inequities that are embedded in processes that on the surface we think are a meritocracy. In fact, they are not. This also requires each of us to recognize our unearned privileges. And the author actually uses a term called the coin, a typical coin that has two sides. And on one measure, many of us are privileged. And on a flip side, many of us are not. But it's that intersection of the two to recognize in what ways I benefit from these systems, these structures that allow me to take advantage that others don't, all based on my social identity and access to resources that is not available broadly. Finally, these two things for me are critical. We've been talking about practice and action. If we've been talking about, you have to do something. But my favorite component is the focus on impact, not intent. And as someone who often engages in activity that does not have the impact I had hoped, we must focus on impact. It can no longer be okay to say, well, that wasn't my intent. To what degree are we owning our own actions and forcing ourselves to think about how do I leverage my privilege, my resources on things that have an impact so that I'm not doing performative allyship? This is critical. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? Particularly as we think about ourselves as universities. And here's where I get a bit provocative. And rest assured, we're having these same conversations here at Queens where I'm pushing my colleagues to really think about, are we doing the things we ought to be doing given who we say we are, who we say we are? So this requires university leadership in the context of Calgary, your executive leadership team, deans, administrative leaders, these are the VPs, et cetera as well as the Board of Governors and the General Faculties Council. Each of those groups must begin exploring the processes that exist in their units that have embedded inequities. And it's in the actual governance structure and the policies that we've created. The governance structure is actually created to maintain the status quo. The status quo isn't gonna cut it if we hope to tear down these embedded structures. It's not enough. Um, my colleagues here at Queens know that I am famous for saying, okay, so we have a governance structure that has been in place for 180 years and it hasn't changed in 180 years as if somehow society hasn't changed in 180 years. Well, of course it has. And yet we will say to ourselves, well, that's our governance structure. We have shared faculty governance folks. We can change that structure, but we have to be willing to unpack it and to actually talk about what are the embedded inequities? What are these interrelated practices from everything from who faculty get to come in? Here at Smith, I have said to my faculty colleagues, and it is resonating, if we really want to be a collaborative academic learning community where people are respected for being their authentic selves, if that's who we really wanna be, we have to change how we assess who we think has a right to teach and learn 
in this space. So we have to unpack how we assess CVs. Which schools do, where do we go to recruit? Do we keep going to these conferences where not everybody has access? How do we do this? What are the solutions? Same thing for PT, by the way, promotion and tenure. Same thing for promotion on the administrative or the staff side. What gets rewarded? Is there a particular group with a particular background that benefits from keeping things the way they are? Is there some kind of hierarchy that exists inside of these principles and policies, which on the surface we think are meritocracy and they seem to work for everyone, but yet they do not. Are we willing to have an honest, candid conversation, dialogue about the norms and practices and organizational cultures that maintain this status quo, that allow us to say, well, you know, they just don't meet our standards. Where did those standards come from? I'm not proud to share that when I began my tenure at Smith, we had zero black faculty. I want you to let that sink in for a minute. We're a top notch business school in a very successful storied university. And we had no black faculty. I'm sure no one is trying to tell me that, we, that they don't exist because they do. So we must begin to unpack, how is it that these qualified black faculty somehow aren't good enough to cross that hurdle to be part of our colleagues? Interestingly, in this year, we have given an offer to two black faculty who are exceptional, by the way. That meant that we had to change the norms, the practices. We had to open our minds. We had to talk about what are the things that look on the surface to be fair and equitable, but when we delve into them, recognizes, oh, actually they're not equal. And how do we weigh these? How do we assess these? And then we had to change those processes to create a more inclusive pool from which we could select faculty. We have plenty of evidence on our, on our campuses um, I often say to my colleagues, we know we're racist in the United States. We have the data to prove it. The sad news is Canada is just now starting to collect that data. The fact that we lumped everybody together in visible minority implied somehow that everybody was having the same experience when we know anecdotally that is not true. So how do we start to unpack that? We have evidence that there's inequality and inequity on campus. We know this, we have the data. We can look at who progresses to full professors. We can look at this by a, a bunch of different categories. We can look around campus and see just how visible the difference is. And does it represent, given the quality of institution that University of Canada is, one of the top in the U15, does it actually reflect what Canada looks like? because you're trying to attract the best to Calgary. And the best and brightest today are no longer only white and only male, and didn't only go to a handful of exceptional universities. So how do we begin to address these things? Like for real, not just a comment, not just a commitment, not just a paper, but actually do the work to begin to unpack this. And then, of course, the key, which is a double-edged sword, is to what degree do the people who have experienced these inequalities and inequities, are they involved in crafting these new practices or policies and procedures? Now, that's a double-edged sword because this means that we have an extra burden and service that perhaps our other colleagues don't have to bear. But you have to do this because if otherwise, you might be missing out things that you're unaware of because you're not receiving that input. It's critical. So it's a balance that you have to weigh here. So these are some of the actions I see immediately that the university has to begin and be willing and public and open 
about addressing. And this is built into our governance structure, which actually is designed to keep us the way we are today, as opposed to evolving to be this more inclusive academic community. Next slide, please. Now, a university or any collective, any establishment is made up of individuals. So not only must there be collective action, the university, faculty, department level, and by departments, I also mean administrative departments, even with our students. That has to happen, but we also have some individual responsibilities to inspire and push our universities to take action. And that requires us to actually learn about and understand systemic racism. And for some people, it's just to admit it actually exists. Because if you don't admit it exists, there's nothing to address. And if you think that the way things are is fine, then there's nothing to address. And you really don't understand what all the noise is about. So you have to take time to unpack this, to look at it and determine its existence is real. And then take the time to talk to people who've experienced this systemic racism and can show you how it presents itself in our day-to-day -day lives, how it's impacted us, how it has shaped our own behaviors. This is important. You have to openly discuss your own privilege. I recognize I have a tremendous amount of privilege, mostly earned, but still privilege. And if I'm unwilling to acknowledge my privilege, I can't begin to see the ways that I benefit from these systems that I need to now help unpack so we have more equity and equality. I have to begin to understand how I've leveraged my advantages to benefit the current systems that are in place. I have to be willing to acknowledge that and then shift that. And it may mean that I don't benefit from that anymore because that's what continues to be this, the, this situation that is unequal, inequitable. This next one for me is critical. I love living in Canada. It's a beautiful place to live, even when it's frigid cold outside. But this obsession with being nice and polite, when in fact, sometimes we need to confront what we see in front of us. I have on occasion shared some experiences I've had in Canada with my friends. And their first response, no, Wanda, I don't think that's what, what they meant. Ladies and gentlemen, I am about to be 60, I think I know racism when I see it. And even to acknowledge our own inabilities and biases. I'll tell you, mine has been around transgender and trying to understand that so I can be a real ally, so I can act to be active, so I can do things in my school to create spaces for members of that community to be their authentic selves. And that's manifesting in things as mundane as a washroom that is all inclusive. If you haven't seen it, I invite you to go uh, to the Haskins School of Business. I actually took pictures, I was so impressed and how these open washrooms allow people to come and go with privacy. That is a huge step in the right direction. And my hat's off to my colleague for, for creating that, Jim DeWall. Instead of saying we're an ally, do something. And not always publicly. Don't always talk about what we're doing because then that puts the attention on us, not on the issues, not on the structure. That's not lifting up the voices of the marginalized. It's making you the center of attention. We've got to do something. We have to work on our own biases. And then we have to check ourselves to protect others from those biases. Be willing to develop this critical consciousness to question our actions and to say, huh, why did I feel that way? 
Why did I make that decision? And to challenge our own selves. That's how we evolve. That's how we admit that we have bias. That's the only way we can begin to unpack the systemic barriers that exist in society and in our own organizations. And then on a real practical level, as I said before, and I will say I have an HR background, so that's probably why I focus so much on HR practices. But I would argue if you're trying to create this inclusive community, it has to start in HR because it starts with who you let in. It starts with whose voice has power, who gets to dictate what's right, what's wrong, what's acceptable, what's excellence. And it starts with these processes. It starts with how do we recognize and award and reward behavior activities? Who is that? That's us. And how do we change those practices, procedures, processes to be more inclusive so that it's, it's a broad, transparent, fair, and equitable? Next slide, please. So I leave you with this and then um, hopefully we can open it up for, for Q&A. Um, if you wanna be a real ally, it's not comfortable. As I reach out to learn more about the transgender community, it is uncomfortable. I don't always make the right decisions. I don't always do the right things, but I am in this process of learning and then I'm in this process because I have the privilege of being a dean of unpacking what does that look like for us here at Smith? And then the, to what degree can I push this as a member of the senior leadership team to talk about what does that mean here at Queens if we're gonna be this inclusive community that we wanna be? It's not enough to be empathetic, to feel bad, to feel horrible, to watch these videos. That's not enough. It's not enough to be angry and frustrated. That's not enough. The only way to be a real ally is to act, is to do something, to put yourself forward in a very uncomfortable place, to have an impact. That's what you want. So uh, next slide, I open it up for, uh, Q&A, and hopefully I got some answers, but I imagine you have just as many answers amongst yourself. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you and uh, interested to hear the, the questions that we have. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for that uh, tour de force. Um, and uh, there are lots of questions. And so I want to uh, start uh, with one of them. Um, which you've touched upon across the press, your, your, your keynote, you highlight something that's often discussed about uh, Canada, which is to say polite, um, nice, uh, which in some ways fosters comfortable conversations. Nothing that's unsettling, disruptive, makes people uncomfortable or even that allows people to learn how to be comfortable with discomfort. So there's a bit of a, a, um, a paradox that a one question, one person wanted to know is, how on the one hand do you enable these kinds of uncomfortable conversations and at the same time ensure psychological safety or um, that people aren't further harmed by uh, the conversation, that this actually is a quite a, a tension and a delicate balance. So knowing how to have the conversations does matter. So how would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to come from a place of transparency, like a willingness to say, I, I probably don't have the right language, but here's what I want us to talk about. And I wanna be able to openly share how I'm experiencing something or have these big questions. And I, and I, and I confess, 
they may be offensive, but that's because I, I'm just new and I'm just trying to figure this out, right? And I think when we, we defer to political correctness, political correctness allows us to maintain the status quo. I think we also have to be willing to say to each other, I'm in here, all of me, to the degree that I can share who I am. And I invite you to come into this arena with me to have this intentional conversation, which for both of us, by the way, is going to be uncomfortable. When I, uh, in our senior leadership meetings or with my dean colleagues, when I bring up things that are very uncomfortable, which I did a couple weeks ago, two big ones, that was it. And I had to preface this by saying, this is uncomfortable for me to say, but I have to say it, right? You have to preface it with that and have the courage to put it on the table because if we don't ever get it on the table, we can't address it. And I think we just have to build up some confidence. We have to build up some self-awareness. We have to engage in self-care and say, I'm gonna be uncomfortable and that's okay. I won't have all the answers and that's okay. And I might offend someone and that's okay. If I were to be really provocative, I would argue comments are made on a daily basis that offend me and nobody seems to care. We actually have a label for them now called microaggression. I'm like, there's nothing micro about it. But it literally happens every day. So again, it's back to this notion of who, who are we protecting? Are we protecting those in power and privilege and making them comfortable as opposed to saying the only way we're going to begin to address these inequities is to have conversations that make us uncomfortable, those of us who are privileged. I think that's the only way we do it. It's not going to be perfect. Someone's going to get up and, and people should, they got to practice self-care. They can get up and leave. I get it. But let's acknowledge that who determines what's unspeakable, what's uncomfortable. We need to have these conversations because as an African-American in Canada, I experience this every day and I don't hear a lot of people being concerned about the degree to which I'm comfortable, right? So maybe we just have to have a bit more empathy and put ourselves in the other shoes and envision that perhaps this is what we deal with every day, right? So that would be my recommendation. Well, thank you for that. And also highlighting that empathy itself can be racialized and gendered and comes with certain kinds of privilege. And we see this even internationally with what kind of events we respond to with care and concern, which, while, which ones we ignore. So I wanna push you a little further based on um, uh, uh, the comments around performative allyship. And, and, and those who are most more concerned about looking good and sounding good and tweeting well, rather than doing good or engaging in activities that actually transform things, which is actually hard work and goes beyond um, brief interventions that might get a lot of likes, make us feel good, but actually maintains the status quo. Um, but calling out, how do we call out or do we call in this performative allyship in ways that actually can lead to change. Yeah, for me, it's I always I always do it in the questioning, right? Help me understand how that act, how that's helping the cause. Like I'm down with the cause. How are you down with the cause? Help me understand that. Black Lives Matter. Yeah, you say that, but what are you actually doing that demonstrates to us that Black Lives really do matter? What are you, what are you in your day-to-day -day life as you're moving through the world? What are you doing? Right? And and recognize that we're all guilty of this at some level, right? We all have a talking track that thinks, makes us feel like, well, I'm 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 in it, right? No, you're not. If you're not feeling any angst or discomfort, if you're not bumping up against your friends and family, 
who have a particular view of the world and you're not having these conversations, then you're not there. I used to say in the US, uh, I, don't, I don't know that this happens in Canada, but it happens in the US all the time. You know, Wanda, I got black friends and my black friends have never told me, I'm like, well, the question is, do your black friends think you're their friend? Because if you're their friend, they've told you about these experiences. Because if you're a friend, they're being honest with you about their day-to-day -day lived experiences. And so if you've not heard that, I hate to break the news to you, that black person actually doesn't think you're a friend, right? So, I mean, and those are very hard things for people to hear, but again, it strikes me from everything I heard at the beginning of today that Calgary actually wants to do this. The University of Calgary wants to actually engage in meaningful transformational change as an academic institution. That means this is the work you have to do. This isn't me telling you what to do. This is the institution itself saying, this is the impact we wanna have. And if we wanna have this kind of impact, we are required to engage in these activities. I would say at the end of the day, universities, post-secondary institutions, we are fodder, we are creating talent and we want the best talent. Well, guess what? If you don't create these kinds of spaces, I don't like the word safe and brave space. I don't like that. I gotta tell you, it's my pet peeve. But what I wanna hear is when I come into the room, do I feel like I gotta get small? Do I feel like I gotta put on armor to come into your space? Do I have to check every time I wanna say something to make sure that makes you feel comfortable? Then that's not the kind of space we want. And that requires us to challenge respectfully with dignity, even apologizing up front and say, but let's get to the root of this. We say this, but here's what we're doing. I don't see evidence of this. Where's the evidence that we do that? We have to hold ourselves accountable to that. So this brings me, thank you. This brings me to, to the language of uh, that we use and how that language itself uh, engages people um, uh, or actually, uh, how it engages people or not. So, so for example, one of the questions that one of the listeners ask is, um, do you use the language of oppressor and white supremacy? And the person is asking this from the perspective of sometimes they feel unsafe. So even if they feel this is, even if they think this is the conditions that they are witnessing, experiencing, that even the using the language um, it, uh, can be uh, make them feel unsafe or create conditions which are disabling for them. And so um, two things, one is how do you deal with this in yourself, but how do you think allies should deal with this? And, I, and I'm thinking of the concept that it, it, uh, um, in, in, in indigenous, engagement, but there's something called the settler collectors, mm -hmm. which is to say, when you see people who are being anti-Indigenous on social media, it's not just up for the handful of Indigenous peoples who might be experiencing it, but it's for the settler collectors, i.e. those who are allies, to intervene and engage. Um, and so, but I name the problem in order to address the problem. So uh, so the person wants to know, what do you think about using, actually naming things for what they are and what responsibility allies have in that in order to uh, affect change? Yeah, I, I think if you're an ally, you have to speak up. Like you can't just hang back and be like, oh, I can't believe that's happening. And then talk about it back here. I hope you actually have to get in the arena. You have to, you know, Brene Brown says, get in the arena, get in the center muck it up, right? And, and I think the, the way to do this is the research shows actually, when you look at this notion of allyship and particularly the motivations for allyship, as you might imagine, a lot of that is about the self and one's self identity and how one wants to be perceived, right? Self aggrandizement. Where you really want to get to is how authentic are your motivations? 
how authentic is what you're saying your reality? Because if your intent is actually to have an impact, the research shows that actually the ally speaking up has a greater impact on changing the thinking of the people who are making those posts and making those comments than you and I could possibly do because we're expected to have a different view. They are not. And that's where I think we get this term about co-conspirator, right? Collaborator, that when they become informed, they begin to unpack and show, well, do you see how maybe this could be true? And often I use that language. Okay, so I hear you. So let's play a game. I just want you to suspend that, that thought for a minute. What if this were true? What would that mean? Like, just, just pretend with me. And then you get to unpack this. Well, if that was true, that would mean this. Do you see evidence of that? Oh, oh, right? And I think we get nervous because it might imply, this is a hard one, that maybe I didn't get to where I am by my own merit. That's a hard one to process. Because frankly, we're all working hard. Of course we are. But some folks don't understand that, and I think you can appreciate this. I said this to um, some young black youth uh, this weekend. It's our black youth in STEM with the engineering. These were literally like grade four or five to grade 10. And I just said, you know what? You know we're there when your mom doesn't tell you you have to be twice as good to be considered equal. Right? And they all started like, look, I'm like, because they got black moms who have already told them that. Right? I'm a black mom. I've already said that. So that tells us that it's inequitable. We're all working hard, but I'm working just to be seen and that the work I'm doing to be elevated and not to be considered an outlier. The number of times I've been told I'm an outlier. No, I'm not actually. I'm the norm, but you haven't opened the door for us to come in. And you have all these criteria that are set up for you that doesn't support us and how we present our ability to have an impact. So I think that's what we have to do, to be honest. I think we just have to be willing to ask people and to create these opportunities to bring real data into the mix. I mean, we happen to be on a university campus, so we can bring real data, we can bring real research into the mix. And not just for academics, we can all communicate with staff, students, to help them begin to see. Remember what I said, if you don't see systemic racism and inequality, then you don't understand what this is all about. So we have to unveil it, we have to take the, the, the lens out right? The cataracts off so that they can actually see. Because once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then it just becomes, wow, okay, dude, does that mean like I benefit from, whoa, okay. Um, how is that fair to these kind of folks, right? So I think we just have to be willing to, to have those diff difficult conversations. And I will say, uh, Dr. Smith, and I'm sure you feel the same, we must use the language that's going to get the work done. You know, this, this language is really important because I, you know, we had to be from different spaces, places, but but are inclined towards directness, but also are navigating this, um, the different ways of being. So this politeness, niceness is seen as normative. Um, and it's a paradox for me because it's like we say we are committed to diversity. But diversity means we also, the different ways of being, talking, speaking, saying things. And, and, and that doesn't mean necessarily deficit. So there is this constant thing where you have to be the same. Uh, and that, and, and that that's actually just needs to be disrupted. But another question that someone asked, because you, you, you highlight the question, the issue of microaggressions, which aren't really micro. And again, the question people are asking is, what's the role and responsibility of these 
ups, allies? Are they upstanders? Are they observers? Are they just, um, you know, and they, or they, they just comment when it's safe behind after the thing, after the harm has been conducted? So this, again, this is the question of how would you grapple with this language of casual racism? Yeah. There's and, nothing and, casual about racism, as I'm sure you know. First of all, it's the language, yeah, right? I'm saying it's you, not casual. <laughs> all these euphemisms keep emerging, but they keep directing, re, redirecting us away from systemic issues. Um, so so I, I think maybe the, part of the question here is, how do we get away from this tendency to individualize to personalize, even interpersonalize issues like racism, oppression, um, gender inequities, uh, transphobia. These aren't individual problems. Um, these are systemic, structural. And how do you get us to shift, to pivot from this, from the one that requires autobiographical solution to one that refocuses on systems, processes, policies, and things that will affect uh, uh, systemic change. Yeah, I, I think at the core is the data that you heard me talk about, right? We, look, I'm sure y'all have the same kind of data we have that suggests the inequalities that exist on this campus. Um, and even if we took it globally in, in Canada, and, and forgive me, I'm gonna focus a bit on the, the academic side. All across North America, we know that women are lecturers, adjuncts, tenuring staff, but they're not full professors. That's not an accident, right? So where's the data that helps us take this out of the individual? It's not that one person, it's the system that is set up. And let's unpack um, the criteria, the, the information we ask for, this notion of how that information is even presented, um, and make that more fair and equitable across the board. Because people will always want to make it about in this one incident, that's not true. No, but it's true in general across the board. And we must be willing to have that conversation. And even in the moment, in, in a particular situation, if we are unwilling to challenge the status quo, this is what it means to be an ally, to challenge the status quo in that moment, then we're not an ally. The, 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 the level below that, that you can begin to show the degree to which you're an ally would be at a minimum in the spirit of Canadian politeness to pull that person aside or later go by their office and say, you know, I, I wanted to, to talk to you about something. Remember when this was going on and you said that I found that offensive. And here's why I found that offensive. Are you aware of X, Y? Like you just have to unpack it for people so that they begin to understand we can't tolerate that because when you leave it there, I'm sure everybody recognizes if you don't speak up, then you're saying it's okay. And if we want that to change, someone has to speak up. I mean, we see this, you know, there's been, there's been some horrible incidences, for example, that could happen on a subway and it's a full subway and someone's been beat to death. And you're like, what were these people doing? They saw this happening. Well, they were waiting for someone else to step up. If you're a real ally, that's you. And your willingness to at least pose these questions and open the door for dialogue. If that never happens, we never get to where we need to be. And I continue to say to folks, if you're never uncomfortable, you're not an ally. If you're not willing to take your own social privilege, your own social capital and put it on the table, you're not an ally, right? And I think what I'm hearing in these questions is, People want to be comfortable. It's not comfortable. That's why I'm, I'm trying to get people grounded in. It's uncomfortable. And so if you're doing something, you're like, oh, this is okay. You're not an ally. It's only when you're doing those things that push you outside your own comfort zone and where you might actually be the out, outlier, where you might actually get some backlash. Now you know you're an ally, right? So people have to individually decide 
Where are they? Now, I also want to say this. If you do the work and you decide that right here at this point in time, I'm not ready to do that, then at least be honest about it and don't get on social media with all the hashtags. Just be honest about it and say, I'm not ready. And then if that's still a personal desire, now you got to go and get ready. You got to build yourself up, your knowledge base and confidence to do that work. I had an incident happen. Uh, I was at an international uh, business teams conference abroad in Europe and uh, a person had a negative experience with happens to be a white male dean who basically was berating this person who has created this professional association for, for women deans to advance women and prepare them for professional development so that they can get in positions of leadership, academic leadership, provosts, deans, presidents. And he just berated her. And she was telling me the story, getting very emotional. I said, I'm sorry, I don't even know why you stood there. Why don't you just call him out and say, with all due respect, it's clear to me that you're quite comfortable with the status quo right now, which puts people like you in power. I'm not about that. So clearly my professional association isn't for you and your staff. I'm going to leave now. Right? Don't stand there and get beat up. And she's like, oh, wow, I've learned so much. So then talk to people who you perceive as having the confidence and courage to do this work and get language, literally. Like I was walking her through, well, had you thought about saying this? And then catch her, like sometimes you're in such shock when it hits you. You got to take a minute and be like, did I just hear what I think I just heard? And then you got to come back because I think part of his, his goal was to shake her up and he was successful. And she didn't have the opportunity to share, here's the value of my organization and here's why that matters. Because at the end of the day, I would think universities want the best leadership talent they could get. And that's not all male anymore. It just isn't, right? So I think it's also about partnering with others who you may perceive as having this this capability to be a little bit more open and then walk through like, how, how would I do this? Or help me understand. And then like, go do it. But at some point in time, you got to speak up. You just got to do it. So I mean, I mean, getting close to the end, I want to ask two more questions because I mean, they, they, so let me just share a little bit about the Q and A. There's a lot of love going on there. There's a oh. lot of, lot of appreciation and lots of questions that we, we couldn't possibly get to. So I, I, you just need to know that um, when I get for these, these couple of questions, two of them, one of them relates to follow up to your comment about data um, and, and, and the need for uh, disaggregated data. As you point out, these, these data have long been available in the United States. They're available in the United Kingdom. The disaggregated data has, have many challenges in Canada, uh, but movement is uh, there's movement towards better disaggregated data. Um, and so including at the University of Calgary with our EDI data hub. But there's also qualitative data and stories and the experiences that people have beyond the numbers. Um, and so there's, there's a question about that, but what responsibility institutions have to provide that data, especially research institutions, to, to collect uh, and disseminate that data so that we can better understand inequities and do something to transform that. So this is now it's about institutions' responsibility, different way of thinking about allyship in a way, in order to affect change. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Of course. I mean, I'm at Queens. Yes, of course. Right. I knew you knew that. Right. Consider where I am. Yes. So listen, uh, I happen to be a qualitative researcher. When I started here at Smith, uh, because of this Instagram account, some of y'all probably know, stolen by Smith before I arrived, uh, which basically was students outing in an Instagram account their their discriminatory bias, racial bias experiences they were having, and of course. My faculty colleagues were in shock. Of course, I was like, I don't know how you could be in shock having a black faculty. So, I mean, that was a clear sign to me that there was obviously probably some issues. And when they created, because we're very responsive at Queens, we're, we're innovative, entrepreneurial, we go do stuff. So they created this uh, strategic EDII action plan. But I have to be honest with you, when I saw it, I was like, 
okay, well, that's just a bunch of KPIs and data, whatever. That doesn't tell me what it feels like to be in the damn building. Pardon my language, right? So we're starting on our new strategic action plan that we're about to roll out for consultation externally, talking about how will we get these stories? Now, one of the things that has started to happen, which most people on the surface would view as a negative, that I view as a positive, is believe it or not, our students from these different backgrounds that haven't traditionally been present at Queens and certainly not in Smith, are actually coming forward and sharing the classroom experiences or the experiences they're having in the classroom with people outside that realm so that we get the information. And then I take that information to our EDII committee, which has faculty and staff and says, here's what happened. How do we unpack this? Well, how do we, how do we prevent this from happening again, right? That's a story, that's an anecdote so that people can't say, oh, it's fine because look at our demographic data, Wanda. I can tell you as I walk through the building, you can see the difference already in the short time I've been here on students, staff, faculty. But it's the experiences, which of course is what I'm terrified about, what's actually happening in the classroom and to what degree are certain voices elevated and other voices squashed. To what degree are we creating, as you said, particularly in an academic classroom, discomfort for the majority, right? So I do think that academic institutions, the institution itself must set the stage by talking about these things and figuring out how do we collect that data? How do we get the qualitative data to help us understand, here's what the numbers say, but here's the experiences people are having. And you do have to create a space for that to happen. I'll tell you one of the things I did right away was say that instead of us internally trying to process uh, complaints, if you will, around EDII, that now goes outside of Smith. Like the minute something comes to someone, it kicks out to our human rights and equity office. They assess it and then they come back to us and say, here's what need, you got an issue, right? So now there's that sense is like, wow, I don't actually have to worry about some kind of backlash in the school because it's going to the office outside and we trust them to come back and tell me I got to act. And then I told them they got to hold me accountable as dean. That's my job, but that's a leadership role and it has to start with the university, right? So I, I want to bring you back to where one of the places you started. You talked about the role and responsibility of leadership. Now, you and I are in leadership positions and you talk about the responsibility of governance, right? And in and, and this work. So we can talk about horizontal accountabilities and allyship. We can talk about activists. We can talk about social media activists. But I, 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 want, uh, I, want, I wonder if you can reflect a bit based on your experience from military, private sector, nonprofit sector, business schools. What do you think are some of the things that need to be done in higher education institution? And you have Calgary, we'll claim our entrepreneurship the same way you claim it at Queens. Uh, <laughs> we'll have a conversation about that. We'll claim our, our innovation and our commitment same as you do at Queens. And yet we, we know we are all grappling with these inequities and we are grappling with the challenge of having these difficult conversations, especially around racism, where there's still denial and claims that there we don't have it, um, that um, around transphobia. What is, the, what, is, what is the role of responsibility of people actually in these roles? Not just in the EDI office or the no, human no, rights no. office, but all of us in order to move the dial. Um, yeah. I think everybody in, in the university is accountable, but there is an increased accountability and responsibility when you are in a position of decision-making power and authority. And in an academic unit, if you are the, even a department chair, but certainly senior and executive leadership, you cannot abdicate this responsibility. You cannot. Now, I had a boss uh, at Pepsi who used to say to us, the fish stinks from the head. Now, I was a city girl. I'm like, I ain't never been fishing in my entire life. right? But as I started to unpack that, what he meant is, yeah, the fish stinks, but it starts at the head. 
So this is a very uncomfortable thing for me to say, but it starts with the president and the principal. And we have presidents and pr principals who at our institutions at least have signaled publicly that this is a priority for them. So that means it's accountable to us around those tables to bring up these matters for intentional conversation and discussion. And I would go so far as to say planning within the governance structure, how do we address that? There can be no abdication of that responsibility. And I would argue as part of the selection process into the senior leadership team, these are the kinds of questions that need to be asked. These are the kinds of experiences we need to look for as we're doing searches for these key positions. It cannot be just verbal. It can't be talk. We have to begin to really challenge these candidates and ourselves. What have you actually done that advances this? What did you do? What was your role? You know, in, in post-secondary, we're often talking about, we don't like people to say, I, well, I did it. Yeah, I did it. Or, or we can't pretend where we're going, it wouldn't be there with a different leader. Like, who are we kidding? We had a different leader. We weren't doing that. Now we have a leader and we're doing, that's not an accident, right? So I would just say, we around the table, and, and here's another piece. I would say the, the academic community needs to hold us accountable for that and make it uncomfortable for us. Force me to say and do something because that's my job. That's my responsibility. And I think again with the, you know, shared faculty governance and being nice and the Canadian politeness. No, you have to hold me accountable. If I'm not gonna hold myself accountable, somebody's gotta hold me accountable. And I would argue the board of governors has a role. They should be holding the principal or the president accountable so that they're getting pressure, frankly, from both sides. And then we have to talk about these at the table and not just talk. Okay, now that we've unpacked that, how are we gonna fix it? What policy are we gonna change? And I don't care how long it takes, start talking about it. Because when senior leaders talk about things, we are signaling this is important. There should be no newsletter that goes out uh, from either of our institutions that doesn't have something in it from the principal or president about EDII. I'm sorry, because if it were important, it'd be there. So again, how are we forcing us to have these conversations and not sit back and say, well, that's just a three-year process, whatever. It's actually not a three-year process. We just have to get busy and do it, do what matters. Yeah. Well, I mean, you remind me of what Maya Angelou said about courage, which is to say, we have to, like a muscle, you have to keep exercising it. You have to, you have to, you have to keep working it. Uh, in, in, in order for it to become more nimble and effective. Um, so one, um, uh, so courage then, if you think of this, that it does need courage and we need to keep exercising it, keep doing it in order to uh, affect change and, 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 and meaningful change. I have, so one final question. And that is this, uh, again, getting us back to the, the key thing here about, um, allyship and co-conspirators. So none of us are outside this system of inequities or oppression. We are all part of it. So you're not, so when people work to combat or mitigate inequities, they, we, they, they're not doing it for, for someone else. We are also part of that process. And you, you, so you talk about privilege or some people benefiting from it and some people being disadvantaged by it. And it reminds me of Albert Memmi's work about um, the colonized and the colonized. So even if you resist colonization, it doesn't preclude you benefiting from it every single day. Um, and so even if you weren't, didn't have slaves, it doesn't mean you don't benefit from it every single day. The advantages of it. 
that's a that's an educational literacy piece that our institutions, our top in research institutions, should be better at. So what's the what's going to help us get to that point where we recognize that this we can't outsource EDI, we can't outsource anti-racism, that we are by our actions, as you were talking about with leadership, we are by our actions or inactions participating in maintaining or transforming the status quo. What is necessary to get us to this kind of understanding? Yeah, that's a powerful question. Um, I think the first thing is what you hinted at, which is recognizing this is happening, right? And figuring out how to embed this throughout the curriculum, I don't care what faculty you happen to be in, throughout the administrative part of the university uh, and throughout the student body and how they engage. The challenge is I find is this is terrifying for people, especially our faculty colleagues for whom being an expert is everything. We're not experts at this. You and I have been doing this work for a long period. I am not an expert. There are days I'm like, way to go, Costin. You're the expert and look what just came out of your mouth, right? <laughs> right? Like you just have to catch it and be like, okay, nice job, Costin, right? But I think our willingness to be open about those missteps, given the work we've been doing, gives people this license to just, could we just begin talking about it and stop being so afraid because it's a process and candidly, we didn't get here. I think it's, uh, well, it's our chancellor, uh, Senator Murray Sinclair, who says, we didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight, <laughs> right? It's a process, but it's also about what are the concrete steps we're taking, recognizing we may take two steps forward and a step back, but let's openly admit that, let's acknowledge it, and let's not let fear get in the way. I read a book a long, long time ago in my late 20s that was called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Do it anyway, right? It's going to make you uncomfortable. Do it anyway. You're going to be leveraging your own personal social capital. Do it anyway, because that's what it takes. You may disadvantage your own desires. Do it anyway. Because if you really are an ally and you really want to start unpacking the systemic structural inequalities and inequities, we got to begin to tear it down one brick at a time. I don't want the conversation to end. <laughs> I, I am deeply grateful, uh, appreciative for the insights, the research, the knowledge, experience uh, uh, that you brought to the table to discuss allyship and so much more. Um, thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, thank you to uh, all the, I mean, <laughs> the Q&A is the questions are just coming. And so I hope we can save those and send them to you just so you can see how deeply engaging uh, this this keynote has been and how people have actually identified with it. So they, they thank you very much for this. Um, and thank you to everyone who's uh, join, who joined. I mean, I just want to say thank you uh, to El, Elder Collins, Sitting Eagle, to uh, Dr. Penny Wertner, um, to you. But also behind the scenes, we know these kinds of events aren't possible with a whole lot of people, actively invisible people who are contributing, uh, faculty, staff, students, uh, alumni. And so I really wanna thank um, Dr. Savan Bukian who organized the week. She's the new director of the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion. Uh, I wanted to thank um, um, Tracy Garrick, uh, Melissa McKay and her team in events, you of Calgary Communications, the tech people. Let's not forget our IT and communications and tech people, the staff who, we people, as we, we could use the, the Ubuntu expression, people see us, but we're standing on the shoulder of giants. It is these folks who keep us and sustain us. So thank you very much. And so I really wanna encourage people to, um, continue to attend EDI week at U of Calgary. Please visit U Calgary 
uh, .ca forward slash equity dash diversity slash inclusion. There's lots more activities going on this week, including because we are intersecting with Black History Month around Black History Month at U of Calgary. So on behalf of all of us uh, in the office of OEDI and at U of Calgary, thank you, Dr. Costin, and thank you to the audience for participating. We greatly appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Appreciate thank it. You.